Hello and welcome to It's Friday and it's time to catch up. Uh, Marco is in the middle of a trip down to Costa Rica, so just keep him in your prayers. I pray for his traveling mercies. I believe he's coming back tomorrow. But in the meantime, we do have Jacob Prash from Northern England, right? Yes, I got back to England yesterday. Now I'm in the north of England, in Cheshire. And I believe you have an upcoming speaking engagement there as well. Correct, Jacob? That'll be tomorrow at the uh, Morial Fellowship uh, in Winsford, on the High Street in Winsford, beginning tomorrow at 11 o'clock. The details are on the Morial website, morial.org. I'll be joined by Pastor um, Tim Leach and also by Pastor Mark Jackson. That's great. And uh, coming to us early, early in the morning, we have David Lister, I believe, in Thailand. Yes, I'm. I'm in Bangkok. We uh, we're heading this week to um, this coming week to uh, some new prisons. We're now in the next few days. We're going to be visiting four different prisons, uh, two brand new. So our list of getting into prisons is expanding, and the gospel is going out. So please pray that the gospel that goes out and it is effective in people's lives. Amen. We should all pray for that. Definitely a country that's filled with uh, mostly atheists and Buddhists. So yep. definitely opportunities to share Christ there. And we cannot forget Davy, the Duke of Down Under. <laughs> Morning, brothers. Good to be with you guys. Thank you, Davy. Good to see you. Good to have you with us. Always good to have you with us. So I just wanted to make sure, do we have any traveling announcements, David, Jacob, Davey, of upcoming events? I know that Jacob is going to do some events in the UK, then he's coming back to the East Coast, right? Yes, New York and Baltimore. That will be uh, the week of the 17th to the 23rd detail of April. The details will be posted on the Morial website. After that, I shall be, I believe, in Devor, and then we shall be in Upcountry Christian Fellowship in Maui, in Hawaii, before arriving in New Zealand. I also have a date in the beginning of April in Essex, England. That is on the Moriel website, moriel.org. Alternatively, you could just Google Moriel Itinerary or Jacob Pash Itinerary, and it will give you the time and the location. All right. Anything to add, Davey or David? Well, for for me, Jacob is going to be making a, his first around the world tour here soon. Um, and so he's going to be speaking in um, not uh, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, uh, going with us to prisons in Thailand and visiting Vietnam and also speaking in Japan, God willing, uh, Singapore, so New please Zealand, pray for his health, yeah. his legs, uh, and going with us to prisons to in get through Thailand and is, um, visiting Vietnam tour. and also. And uh, J Jacob will be in uh, both New Zealand and Australia in mid-May through to early June. Um, he'll be in Auckland. Saturday and Sunday, May 11th and 12th, Christchurch, Tuesday and Wednesday, May 14th, 15th, Wellington, May 17th and May 18th, <clears throat> Brisbane, Australia, May 22nd, Sydney, May 26th and oh, 25th and 26th, Melbourne, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, May 31st, June 1st and 2nd, and Perth, Tuesday, June 4th and Wednesday, June 5th. So, for more details, yeah, just uh, for New Zealand, email us at morielnz at gmail.com or for Australia, email us at morielaustralia at gmail.com. Well, that is uh, quite the schedule, Jacob and David. Um, pray that God gives you the energy to continue such yes. a rigorous schedule. Um, I don't know how you do it. Praise God. I mean... On the 9th of uh, June, I shall be at Calvary Chapel, Singapore. 
That's right. We'll be getting that up on the website. Did you confirm that with the pastor yeah. already? Okay, because yes. I did too. I did for you. So you were traveling. So we'll Praise get it God. up on the website. Praise God. Gospel is being preached throughout the world. That's that's awesome. Uh, Jacob, um, let's go ahead and get started with catching up. Uh, let's start let's with that. your hot take of the week. Jacob, what, what news captured your ire this week? Yes. There's no one issue. As we get closer to the elections, almost everything in the United States is framed within that general context. But as we say as you, in French, is it an expression in French? Le plus le change, le plus le reste le même. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, I have no hope in any kind of a political salvation or solution, as you know. I will pray for whoever gets elected, but I do not trust or believe anything that's being said by the media. I certainly don't trust anything being said or promised by the Republican Party. But everything that happens is focused around the quest for power. When you've got this horrible judge, a man who should die in Sing Sing, along with the Attorney General of of, of the state of New York um, for a malicious prosecution that's politically motivated with a ridiculous fine and trying to seize private assets to pay a fine with, that is under appeal um, is a gross, ugly injustice in a, in a two standards system of jurisprudence in a country that has lost its integrity, a judicial system that never had any integrity to begin with but now has gone to an all-time low. That's just one instance. The other is I celebrated. I rejoiced when Mr. Johnson became the Speaker of the House. I really thought he's a conservative with a conservative voting record from a conservative state and that he is a professed born-again believer in Jesus and he was going to show integrity instead of deference to political consideration, he would do what's right. This budget compromise, which will increase the deficit now to $34.6 trillion as a stopgap measure, will still allow 5,000 people to cross the border illegally. It'll still allow for full-time abortion funding, full-term abortion funding. And uh, it, it's abysmal. It's a bis Why would he do that? Why would a conservative do that? Why would a Christian do that? But politics becomes their religion. Their God becomes something other than the God of the Bible. We don't have any statesmen. We only have politicians, and that includes people who say they're born again. Now, again, I, I, I liked him. I, I wanted him to be the speaker. I like Ted Cruz. I like him. But I have no faith or confidence anymore in any of them. Certainly not in Mr. Trump. We've reached another crisis point now. Mike Gallagher has decided to put a departing dagger into the back of the Republican Party, leaving the Republicans with a one-vote margin in the House. The Democrats almost have control again. Almost have control. This will exist at least temporarily, a very thin margin, which in part accounts for the actions of Mr. Johnson <clears throat> to compromise, even though that entailed compromising on abortion, which he should not have done, compromising on the border, which he should not have done. This is the state that we are in. Uh, and, and, and Gallagher just walks out, leaving this mess. The Democrats almost have control of the House again. Now, we were fed, spoon-fed rubbish by Dick Morris, by Newt Gingrich, by one so-called conservative commentator after another that there was going to be a red wave in the midterm elections of two years ago, of 2022. The Democrats made gains in the Senate. 
certainly through the fault of the Rhino Republican National Committee, but certainly through the failed leadership of Donald Trump personally. He is responsible for what happened in Pennsylvania and partially responsible for what happened in Georgia. Nothing against Mr. Walker, but, but, but to get a Muslim, a Turkish citizen, to run against the conservative for the Senate seat in Pennsylvania, no wonder they lost. I have no faith in Mr. Trump. I do not have any faith whatsoever in that man since he held the homosexual and lesbian gala in Mar-a-Lago. God may allow him to win. God forbid the Democrats should win, but I don't think he's God's man or that God's hand is on him. God is no respecter of persons and an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. Donald Trump compromised on the homosexual issue. Now, Mr. Johnson has compromised on the abortion issue. And we know that people like Newt Gingrich and Nick Marr, they just speak rubbish. They can't, can't be taken seriously. Their opinions are, are, are worthless. They have worthless opinions. They, they've discredited themselves. We've got a very, very good chance that the Democrats can regain control of the House. It's God's judgment. Nations get the leaders they deserve. As I've always said, the Democratic Party is godless slime. The Republican Party is godless slime. It's only a question of which kind of godless slime is going to get power. They've all turned against the Judeo-Christian principles on which the country was ostensibly built. Mr. Trump, at Mar-a-Lago, he lost my respect. His mishandling of the 20 of the 2022 midterm elections, he's lost my confidence. Of course, I don't blame him exclusively for it, but I blame him to a large degree. He bears a major degree of responsibility for having made a loss in the Senate and only narrowly taken back the House, which we may even lose, which may even be lost. I have no confidence in him as a leader, and I don't think God's hand is on him or he's any kind of a political savior. When I see these preachers trying to say this, this is just rubbish. These same preachers said this stuff about Proposition 8 in California. And what happened? Nothing. A homosexual Republican judge appointed by Bush and nominated to the bench by Reagan outlawed Proposition 8. These Christians who are looking for any kind of a political solution are naive, undiscerning, and are setting themselves up to be let down. I was let down by Mr. Johnson today. I thought he was made of better stuff as a Christian, that he would not compromise on the abortion issue. I didn't think Mr. Trump would compromise on the same-sex issue. But they did. It's politics, and they act under political pressure. Instead of trusting God, they trust the pundits. They trust the polls. These are not leaders you can trust or respect or have any confidence in. Now, again, I don't want Biden to get reelected or any Democrat to be reelected. God forbid that should happen. I pray it doesn't happen. But that does not mean that I have any confidence or respect in the Republican Party, including many of those who say they are conservatives and Christians and pro-life within it. I just don't. I don't. I think these people like Jack Hibbs are well-intentioned, but I think they're very naive. They're very gullible. And in, in fact, much of what they do is their thinking is not even scripturally based. It does not have God's wisdom. Not to question their motives, but it's all rubbish. This is the reality of what is happening. It is all politics and the politics are corrupt. Not only that, it is very easy to see how this election can be rigged. Very easy. The people who are in power are not people with any scruples or any morals about anything. They're political whores of both parties. They're basically political whores. Elections can be rigged, and there will be attempts to rig this one. No doubt about it. No question about it. Now, will I pray? Certainly. 
Will I wish well to the victor? Certainly. Do I dread the prospect of Biden or another liberal Democrat controlled by Obama? Of course I do. But my only hope is the return of Jesus. Yes, that amen. is my only hope. And I am not pre-trib, but I hope for his return. And I now have reached the point, like Jeremiah, don't even pray for these people. I pray for the judgment of God to come upon them. Thank you, Jacob. Um, this uh, week also, in that same August body of Congress that Mike Johnson is the head of, supposedly, uh, we had a Title IX debate. Um, Title IX is to allow, uh, well, the debate is to allow mentally ill uh, people who want to deny reality, uh, men specifically, to compete with women and injure them. And all the while, uh, I believe Jerry Nadler had something very interesting to say. Jacob, you mentioned, what did what did Jerry Nadler have to say uh, about men competing against women? In the face of testimony, in the face of the testimony of a young woman athlete who was on a volleyball team, who was seriously injured, left permanently injured, playing against transgender males. Her name is Peyton McNabb. Jerry Nadler says... Men do not compete with women. In other words, transgender men are just women. It would have seemed that's what he's saying. Even worse was the member of the squad, the enemy of Israel, the enemy of America, I would argue, Pramila Jayapal, who has a son who is non-binary, uh, does not wish to be identified as a male. Uh, she said that the numbers of transsexual people and transgender people are minute and they pose no threat. They do no harm. Well, tell that to the female athletes who are being injured, including Peyton McNabb, who's been left permanently injured. This just shows that the left does not really care about women's rights. The feminists were all in favor of Title IX. But when it comes to transgenders competing against women, it's a different story. They don't care about women. Feminists have just been stooges for the establishment. That's all. They have been stooges for the establishment. The establishment does not care about women or women's rights. They're happy to have women competing against biological males even being injured where you have natural male advantages in terms of orthomuscular capacity and in terms of hormonal capacity. It doesn't matter. The women can go get lost. We're all, oh, we're for the women. There's a war on women by the Republicans or by the conservatives. No, there's a war on women by the liberal Democrats. Uh, they use women the same way they use blacks as stooges, as ignorant stooges who they can manipulate, who will buy in to a bill of goods that is a litany of lies. That's what they do. Well, people reap what they sow. That's what you want. That's what you got. As I say, as long as they continue to vote for the party of Jim Crow and of slavery, we can be assured that black Americans will always be the low man on the totem pole, socioeconomically, they will always be dis disenfranchised, and they will always be at the bottom rung of the ladder. Asians will pass them, Latinos will pass them, and because of casinos, Native Americans will pass them. The black man will always be the lowest because he puts himself there with his votes. That's what's happening. Now women, of finding out the reality, that they were just stooges. Well, you want to be a stooge? Be a stooge. This is what you wanted? This is what you've got. Well, the congresswoman forgot about the six people murdered in Nashville school, Jacob. So I guess this transgender woman did do some harm. Oh, yeah. That Well... You're not allowed to say that. It's not politically correct. It doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah, that'd be me. 
not correct, politically correct. I, I wonder, uh, Primila Jayapal and uh, Jerry Nadler, uh, is it time for a cognitive test, considering that they want to say that there's such a small amount of transsexuals in, in sports? Because this is a bigger and bigger issue as it seems, with uh, transsexuals dominating women's sports. Well, is Remember, Nadler, Nadler, yeah, Nadler was the culprit who, together with Adam Schiff, pursued and led the bogus impeachment prosecution against Donald Trump. This is Nadler. Nadler was a man with no integrity. The charges had no substance, no basis, just politically motivated. The man is an enemy of integrity in, in government. He's an enemy of, 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 of due process. Common He's sense. an enemy of reason and common sense. Yet there are people stupid enough to vote for him. Liberal Jews are stupid enough to vote for politicians who will betray Israel. They'll vote for Nadler. They'll vote for Wasserman Schultz. They'll vote for Schumer. They will vote for Himmler if it's in their political interest. Liberal American Jews would vote for Eichmann. And in fact, that is what they're doing when you're in a party with the squad. Why don't you just say what you are, an enemy of your own people? Mm, yeah. Mr. Trump got not. in trouble for saying the same thing there, Jacob. Who? Mr. Trump. Yep. He said the same thing, and uh, the media is after him for saying Jews oh. hate uh, themselves, basically. Hate Israel. Sure. Yeah. Truth hurts. Uh, turning yeah. our attention to the to our our brothers across the uh, pond, uh, David Cameron has called for a arms embargo on Israel. Um, Jacob, talk to me a little about that. It, is he still in office? He was the prime minister after he lost the Brexit vote because he was pro-Europe. After he lost the Brexit vote, he stepped down as prime minister, having been defeated even with them in his own party and by the popular vote. He was brought back into government to be the foreign minister by the present loser who the Tory party has as prime minister. Uh, there is a prime minister in waiting another Mrs. Thatcher type, uh, Suella Breverman, but the establishment hates her. She's also an Asian, by the way. But yes, David Cameron was the Europhile who tried to keep Britain in Europe and prevent Brexit. He was fortunately defeated by Ni Nigel Farage's efforts uh, in, in his battle to keep Britain in Europe. But he's back in government. And yes, he is threatening to place an arms embargo on Israel. He's not threatening to place an arms embargo on any Arab country, <laughs> only on Israel, uh, that I know of. Why isn't he threatening Hamas? Why isn't he threatening Hezbollah? Why isn't he threatening Iran? No, he's just threatening Israel. This is what he is. Well, God's judgment is coming on Britain. Britain is not in a good way economically. The Conservative Party is in great danger of losing the election, and if a Labour government comes to power, it will become even worse and even more hostile to Israel. Britain is going down the tubes, and on the global stage, nobody cares. It's amazing what is happening economically in Britain and what is happening economically in Canada are very serious, but nobody cares. Nobody cares. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Cameron and the present government are bringing God's judgment on Britain. There is no doubt, and Trudeau is bringing it on Canada. It will happen. Mark my words. Jacob, the people's inability to see this is a judgment in itself, isn't it, spiritually? Of course it is. Of course it is. All they want is good news, almost as if, uh, t tell us only good things. Uh, speak to yes. us smooth words. 
That is what the scripture says they would do. They'd get false prophets who would tickle their ears. You mentioned that uh, in Britain, police are cracking down on Christians, arresting them. We know uh, yeah. for a fact of Christians praying in front of abortion clinics. But there's other uh, places where Christians that have tried to stand up in public have been arrested by the regime in Britain. Even standing across the street from abortion clinics, outside of the exclusion zone, praying silently, not verbally or audibly, have been arrested. You see, the police in Britain have become political instruments of corruption and hypocrisy. They are trying to recruit policemen who will be controllable cowards. They want cowards to be cops. They want feminists to be cops. They want homosexuals to be cops. That is the recruitment direction of many of the police departments in Britain and of the British uh, Home Office. Why is this? Muslims will fight. They will riot. Okay? They'll become violent. Christians will not. Therefore, it's easy for the cops to pick on Christians, abuse Christians, arrest Christians unjustly. They wouldn't dare stand up to militant Islam, much less to homosexual radicalism. They wouldn't stand up to any of that stuff. They wouldn't. Those people will fight back. Christians won't. So you pick on the vulnerable. The po political establishment in Britain have been turning the British police into a cater of cowards in blue. That's what they have been turning into. The politicians are turning the cops into a core of cowards in blue. Mm. At the same time, I believe the Lord Mayor of London is talking about putting Arabic in public schools in, in Britain? He's trying to promote Arabic language education in the schools in London. Hmm. He has also said that terrorism is a way of life. We need to get used to it. Now, hmm. the terrorism that takes place in Britain since the end of the Troubles in Northern Ireland is virtually 100% Islamic. He's a Muslim. What he's saying is, because terrorism is normal in the Muslim world, the Judeo-Christian world should have to get used to it and accept it. That's what he's saying. Yet, there are stupid people who will vote Labour, just as there are stupid people who will vote Liberal Democrat in America. They vote for this. Scotland, you've got a Muslim first minister. Mayor of London is a Muslim. You've got a Hindu prime minister of, 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 of Great Britain. It's, 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 England is no longer English. Britain is no longer British. And people on the left will say that that's a good thing. Of course they will. Our next story is the U.S., uh, in, in lockstep with David Cameron, as it seems, has called for a vote this Friday on a U.N. resolution declaring the immediate ceasefire in Gaza is imperative. The U.S. has said the resolution uh, declares that the immediate and sustained ceasefire is to aid two million hungry Palestinians. This all the while not even talking about the hostages or oh, their release. God. This is to be done without a ceasefire, a ceasefire without any concessions of the release of hostages. Correct. No food or humanitarian aid or water or anything else should have been allowed into Gaza unless the hostages were released. But under political pressure, the Israelis let it in. They should not have allowed anything in, but they were pressured by Biden. Hamas has stated that they will continue the jihad. They will have no other outcome than the river to the sea from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, and that there will be further October 7th attacks. And the policy of the Biden administration is to be sure that they still exist to be able to do it. Biden is determined at the behest of Barack Obama, his controller, I'm convinced, to make sure 
Hamas lives to fight another day and to carry out their threats of more October 7th. Barack Obama is an enemy of Israel. He's an enemy of Israel. He's always been an enemy of Israel. Politically forced to play ball? Yes, but an enemy of Israel, and he's pulling Obama's strings with Susan Rice and these other people. This is what is happening. No mention of hostages. Make sure Hamas lives to fight another day. Don't wipe them out. Otherwise, they won't be able to perpetrate another October 7th. Biden, Joe Obama, wants to preserve the existence of Hamas because that's whose side they are really on, Iran. Now, look at what's happening. Look at what's happening. Just look at the worthless cowardice of Joe Obama. When Obama was president, there was an uprising in Iran. What did Barack Obama do? Nothing. He took the side of the imams and gave no support to those trying to overthrow the imams. He was on the imam side. He made these concessions, allowing them to continue the pursuit of the development of nuclear weapons. Inspections, giving them a month notice of the inspections, ridiculous things. Between him and Biden, unfreezing over 300 billion in cash assets to fund Iranian-sponsored Islamic terror. They funded it. Plus the six billion they gave and this finagling that went on through South Korea. And that money they found on the airplane that they tried to hide. Open corruption. Obama drew a line in the sand in Syria and said, don't use chemical weapons. That was the red line. When that red line was crossed by Assad, backed by Russia, Obama did nothing. They know he is an invertebrate who has no gonads. They knew he was a weak and is a weak coward. That is his nature. Remember, when he left, when he became president, he reappointed Bush as Secretary of Defense. He reappointed Gates. His national security team was dominated by Bush's people. That's how they got bin Laden eventually. It wasn't Obama. It was the Republican leftovers who he reappointed. Barack Obama is a spineless invertebrate who is, has been emasculated. And they know it. Oh, uh, Biden is the same thing, only a senile version of it. And they know it. Well, what else has happened? What they did with Iran? Now they are doing once again with Iran, with the Hutus, Houthis, with the Hezbollah in Lebanon and with the Hamas in Gaza. But there's another one they are doing it with. As we speak, there are pockets of uprisings taking place in Cuba, including in Havana. People are protesting. The Cuban government is very nervous. Their economy is breaking down. Is the mainstream media reporting it? No. Is the United States government doing anything to lend any support or encouragement to the Cubans rising up against the regime that Fidel Castro and his brother Raul have left in place? No. No. Barack Obama went down there to a baseball game. You're looking at, the, again, the politics of betrayal. But it gets worse. Biden made a deal this week with Ping from China. He agreed to stop talking about human rights and making issue of the violation of human rights in China by a Chinese government Gestapo organization. If China would not stop manufacturing fentanyl, but curtail the production of certain chemicals 
used in the manufacture of fentanyl that he is allowing to come across the border from Mexico every day. You couldn't dream of anything more absurd. The world knows Joe Obama is weak, corrupt, stupid, and cowardly. That was true of Barack Obama. It is true of Barack Obama, and it's true of Biden. Jinping knows it. The Iranians know it. Putin knows it. Everybody knows it. Other than the morons who will vote for such people. Other than the women on The View. Other than the Hollywood limousine liberals. But everybody else knows it. Obama is the Nobel Peace Prize that just keeps on giving and giving. Uh, you know, I must say, when Jerry Adams got the Nobel Peace Prize and Lee Van Duck and Kissinger got the Nobel Peace Prize and when Yasser Arafat got the Nobel Peace Prize, it was obvious the Nobel Peace Prize was a worthless joke. They gave it to terrorists. However, with Barack Obama, it was different. He got the Nobel Peace Prize for nothing. They gave him the Nobel Peace Prize for doing absolutely nothing. They just gave it to him. Unbelievable. It's called an Affirmative Action Peace Prize. Yeah. Oh. Nobel Peace Prize is a joke. I just want to go back to Davey real quick. You had a something that you wanted to talk about in Britain's, uh, the the UK tra train station, correct? Oh, yeah. Just when you were talking about the Islamification of the UK and what's going on there and, and with the school things that's happening in Ireland too. But Jacob, I wanted to get your thoughts on when the UK rail stations, I think it was uh, King's Cross Station, put, was putting up the Hadith burst of the day to celebrate yes. Ramadan. Yes. And they were putting Palestinian flags on the bridges across the Liffey River in Dublin. That's what they were doing. There was somewhat of a protest. Somewhat of a protest. But what you're seeing is the aggressive Islamification of the English-speaking world. The governments in Australia, the governments in the United States, and the governments of Great Britain are all lending credence to this agenda. All of them. After September 11th, after the London 2 bombings, after whatever, they still do it. This is the kind of thinking that characterized Judah before the Babylonian captivity. They kept placating their enemies. They kept pushing the enemy's agenda. They kept persecuting those who warned against it. And they reaped what they sowed. This is what's happening. All right. Uh, moving so on. What, what is very interesting, what is very interesting is this. God has his hands. It says in the scriptures, Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Israel. He who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The American proposed resolution at the UN has been vetoed by two Security Council members, Russia and China. Now, Russia and China are not friends of Israel. Russia and China both want to cease fire, but they don't like the wording of the proposed resolution drawn up by Biden and Blinken. And so they're opposing it, not because they're in favor of Israel, but because they're opposed to the United States and because they can know, know they can make a fool publicly out of, out, out of Biden, which doesn't take a lot of skill or imagination. You, you know, Making ma making Biden look like a fool is like trying to make the grass look green or the sky blue. Everybody knows it. Um, but 
But of all the people, all the nations, it is Russia and China that has vetoed the American resolution betraying Israel. This is the hand of God. This is the hand of God. Because those nations are not on Israel's side. They have their own agenda and their own reason for doing it, which is anti-Americanism. That is it. Unbelievable. But it does show the hand of God. I was about to say, Jacob, given that China and, and Russia vetoed it, and they you are right, they, they are not Israel's friends, but would would God bless those two countries for do, for being Israel doing Israel a solid favor like that? Had they done it because of some kind of pro-Zionism or friendship or goodwill towards Israel, I think he may have. But I don't think that's why they did it. Mm. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Jacob, do you think they're pushing America down because they have their own plan that's going to come Absolutely. up? Absolutely. China, China and Russia both want to be power brokers in the Middle East, not the United States. That yeah. is why they beat out this resolution. They do not want the United States to be, be the ones to bring about a ceasefire. They, they, they brokered a, a rapprochement between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. They want to be the ones to do it and push America out. That is their motive for vetoing it. Um, yes. And that's all. That's all. It is part of their overall strategy, the same as BRICS, the same as everything else they do. That's their agenda. And when they, when they see weak leaders like Obama and Biden, they smell blood. They see opportunity. When they see Trump is in trouble and may not get reelected, um, they smell blood. They see opportunity. When they see that Obama's in his basement in his sweatpants uh, talking into Joe Biden's ear, it easily can be seen that they're going to be taking yes. over the Middle East as power brokers. I want to move on to uh, this what interview. Thing, what thing, Jay, please. It was again underreported that last week Obama paid a very low profile visit to London and met with the British Prime Minister just before Cameron's announcement hmm. and just before this resolution was proposed in New York. Now, Blinken is incompetent. Nobody takes him seriously. Biden is stupid, corrupt, and senile. Nobody takes him seriously. Barack Obama came and did it himself. He wasn't pulling any strings. He came over to London to get Cameron to act himself. Wasn't that a violation as a private citizen to meeting? Sure. Of course it is. But try proving it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you if you had people like the FBI investigating it, I'm sure we would get to the bottom of that real quick. That's right. Yeah. Uh moving on, I want to play a video for you. This is the that just doesn't happen every day. It's a confrontation uh of the accepted narr narrative of most leftists. Uh, please watch this interview with Douglas Murray and watch the lying reporter squirm. Here we go. Um... But uh, the allegation of genocide against Israel, why would Israel be committing genocide in Gaza? Like, well, what would you describe it? If you start a war, which is what Hamas did on the 7th of October, if you start a war, there are repercussions. There are repercussions for Hamas for starting a war against Israel. But the isn't repercussion there repercussions is, for an illegal occupation? What's the illegal occupation? 
of Israel uh, against the Palestinians. Where? That is an illegal occupation. Where? It is a determined illegal occupation. Gaza? Of course, Gaza and the West Bank. Have what you been to think? Gaza? Yes, I have. Is it occupied by the Israelis? It's completely sealed off, as you know. That's by why who? They call it by the Israelis. And who? By the Israelis, by the US and whoever else supports and who else? the Israelis. Isn't that enough? No, tell me who else is allegedly sealing the Gaza. I, I'm saying that Israel is, well, what? Is, 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 has completely encircled Gaza. Nothing goes in, nothing goes Gaza out, as has. you know. Well, as you know, if you've been, Gaza also has a border with Egypt. Why do you not mention Egypt? Egypt has a stronger fence to fence in the people of Gaza okay, than so, Israel Okay, so you does. agree that, that Gaza has been fenced off? No, it's, fence, it's fenced off, although you might note that there are more workers, until the 7th, allowed into Israel to work and indeed to have medical treatments and others that were considered necessary, which Hamas doesn't provide. There was plenty more people every day coming in to work in Israel from Gaza until the 7th than were going the, the other way into Egypt. So if I go back to this question. Why do you say there's an illegal occupation? Because there is. Why? Well, who Israel is occupying is an it? occupying state. No, no. It, who, it is hang, hang on. internationally who is, recognized. No, 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 it's not, it's, no, no. It's I'm, not at all. I want to move that's on. That's your view. Hang on, that's your view, and okay, I have to okay, correct your view, view. Our views I, I differ. I have to correct. No, it doesn't. The facts, <laughs> our views might differ, but the facts are the facts, and I want to pick you up on something you just did. I'm you interviewing said, you. I know, but I, yes. don't th I think you're uninformed. No, no, no. So no, let me just, so let me, you are uninformed, <laughs> oh, because really? first of all, yes. you didn't say that Egypt is blockading Gaza. Secondly, you claim that I'm, Isra I'm I'm Israel... I'm talking about Israel here, the and, I, and I want oh, to well, move It's I want very to move convenient for this. you to mention Israel, because oh. you've clearly got an animus here. But let me come on to the second <laughs> point. Let me come to the second point. As you well know, in 2005, Israeli troops ripped Jewish families from their home in the Gaza. That was hang after on, Palestinians on, on. had been ripped from their, their homes well, in Gaza. I mean, Gaza. how far do you want to go? Okay. Well, you can do no. the Hebron massacre of 1924 no, if you want. But let me finish. No, what I want to talk about Allow me to finish one point. What I want to talk about is, we're talking point. about the, the, the action at the International Court of Justice, no, no, no. okay? But first of all, before we go on to that, you've got to inform your viewers. Yes, but we've got to inform your viewers of the facts, and you just misled them. In 2005, <laughs> Israel, Israeli troops ripped Jewish, every Jewish family from their homes in Gaza and handed over all of Gaza, which was completely clear of Jews. That was after they two hand, Nakbas, hand, they, I think in 1948 and 1967, uh, when Palestinians want, were ripped you, from their homes no, that were, that's, that's, they were that's originally your, there. That's your I know, so let's specific agree, interpretation let's of the history. And yours is disagree. a very... No, no, no. But, but we can agree to disagree, but don't misinform your viewers. You well you know that Hamas, this monster you with, well you know that Hamas did not commit Hamas. the massacre of the 7th of October because of settlements. They did it by their own admission because they want to massacre every Jew they can get their hands on, and Hamas has said they will do it again and again. So don't get onto the distraction of settlements. That is a second order priority. The first order... It's easy the, to fob those off, isn't it's it? It's easy for you to try to distract people <laughs> okay. about it, but I'm no, no, saying... No, no. Don't okay, distract gonna, them we, from the crimes of Hamas. Don't do that. I'm not distracting. Well, you are. You no, just said I, that's I, why they did it. You I, said they I, did it because I of the settlements. And no, those crimes nobody, by Hamas were repugnant. I'm glad and you despicable. said that. Finally, I t yeah. do you think Hamas uh, want to live beside the Jews? Yes or no? Uh, they have recently said that they would be happy to live next to Jews, but oh. they want a two-state solution. A two-state oh. solution has been in the offing. Hamas has not said they want a two-state solution. They carried out a massacre on October the 7th of as many people as they could, stole a lot of hostages who you still also haven't referred to. There's more than 100 Jewish hostages still in Gaza. That's, Correct. That's real kidnapping, and that's real occupation of somebody. Jay, this. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. People that uh, this man disarmed all of her bias, her animus towards towards Israel. Christians should learn from this video so that they can defend Israel. 
and watch it a couple times trying to get these things in your head and you should be able to hold off anybody with just this guy was calm he was collected he had his facts he's also a war reporter in the ukraine uh so he is a good reporter he's solid and he wants the truth and the facts out there and he's right there's no there's no resolve that they want a two-state solution. That's just made up to cover up the lie that Jacob spoke of Hamas a few minutes ago. From the river to the sea, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, they want to push every Jew into it. And media-type people like this are, are shills for Hamas, for terrorism, and for anti-Semitism across the world. Here's a guy that knows how to take it on, and and hopefully Christians or those people that love Israel will learn how to do this and use this as a weapon against these, and hopefully it opens some minds. It would be very hard to open up a closed mind or even a mind that's been turned over, but at least you'll have your say and you'll have the facts. You know, David, I found it very interesting in that video, if you watch it again when you have a chance the body language of that that reporter is very telling every time she was challenged what did she do she laughed she laughed at almost every single time she was challenged and then a couple of times you could see her visibly wincing when he would make yeah. some of the points yeah. as if telling she lost control she yeah. yeah she wasn't in control in nope. that interview at all. That was a beautiful and, interview. Yeah. The woman is a habitual liar, obviously. She states facts that are untrue, that can be easily documented to be untrue, but states them as if they were each one was a fait accompli. Israel went in in 1948. No, Israel did not go into Gaza in 1948. Egypt controlled Gaza in 1948 until 1967. The Israelis did not pull people out of their homes. They let them stay there. According to the World Health Organization of the UN, under the Israelis after 1967, when Israel was forced to capture Gaza in self-defense, the standard of living of Gaza Arabs increased by 370%. Longevity, infant mortality, employment, their standard of living increased 370%. Under the Egyptians, under Nasser, they were teetering on the brink of subhuman poverty. Their standard of living got better. The woman is a liar. Yeah. The Israelis left in 2005. There were three previous violations of the ceasefire after 2005. Under pressure from the Saudi-owned and operated Bush administration, the Israelis pulled it out without any peace treaty or guarantees in the hope of peace. They forced the Jewish community who lived in Gaza to leave, and they just left. Iran moved in following the civil war between the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, and Hamas. They killed 8,000 of each other. They broke the peace treaty that existed until October 6th. There was no Israeli occupation. They had a border open with Egypt, but the Egyptians put more restrictions than the Israelis did. Up until October 6th, between six and 8,000 Gaza Arabs went to work every day to earn a living in Israel. Energy, water, medicine, food, all was transported freely into Gaza every single day. Not from Egypt, mainly from Israel. The woman just lied and lied and lied again and stated lies as if they were facts. And people will believe those lies. This is just Goebbels. This is just Olesky. Tell the lie often enough and there'll be enough stupid people to think it's the truth just because you keep repeating it. This is the mentality of a Nazi. It's the mentality of a Stalinist. It's the mentality of Olensky. It's the mentality of Islam. Just lie and lie and don't stop lying. Stick to the narrative and people yeah. will think it's the truth. Um, you know, if if 
A liar like her, no liar shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. If that liar was dragged out by her hair, held down by her throat and had her tongue cut out, and was branded on both sides of her face with an L for liar, that would be nothing like what is waiting for her. That's right. No liar shall enter the kingdom of heaven. If somebody was to drag her out by her hair, brand her on both sides of her face and cut her tongue out, they would be doing her a favor compared to what is going to happen to her when she gives up the ghost. This woman is a habitual, malicious liar. And there is no euphemism for what she is. But you know what? Ora Gorling is no better in my opinion. There are many journalists no better in my opinion. She is just a mouthpiece for Islamic terror, and she should be treated as such. Yeah. Jacob, she mentioned 1947. And if I remember, 48, 48, yeah, 48. well, I know, but, but she said 47. So I just thought I'd point that out. Her facts were wrong. But anyway, she, uh, she was mentioning that about Israel taking over and moving people out. If my memory is right, Israel offered every Arab who wanted to stay and wouldn't fight against the Israelites citizenship in the new country. You didn't have to fight your brother. Yeah, that, you that, was not, to... uh, that was not Gaza. That was in Israel proper. Yeah, no, I'm not, not Gaza, but I'm talking about the Arabs that are in there. Yes. They didn't move yeah, people sure. out of Israel. They said, hey, stay, don't fight us. You can be a citizen of Israel. Arabs right? who left are not refugees. They left at the behest of the United Arab Command, who told right. them to leave and will push the Jews into the sea. Then you can go back. Only they lost the war. They didn't come out as refugees forced out. They came out of their own volition at the behest of the United Arab Command. But any one of them that stayed became yep. citizens. If they wanted, yes. Yep. Pretty fair, isn't it? More yes. than fair. We're about to hit the hour mark, so I just want to remind everyone to get your questions in because when we go to backstage, Jacob will be answering all the questions submitted. And I believe, if I can convince him, Davey will be asking those questions. <laughs> Hopefully. Right, Davey? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so our next story, it's, it's interesting that it parallels because I actually have a Bible verse that I wanted to share with it. But first, let's watch these videos. This is something that's been going on in America more and more. Um, it started off with uh, just a few outliers were were doing this property seizure by squatting rights but now it seems to be morphing into something even larger and more devastating um just give me a second and i will share my video we'll begin with this video be trying to steal my house yes you are how about that a squatter standoff a property owner confronts a group of people she says moved into her million dollar home in queens and our cameras were rolling as dozens of officers showed up several people were taken away in handcuffs and one of those arrested may surprise you investigative reporter dan krauth joins us now with more on what happened tell us dan well, this is a very big growing problem. I received dozens of tips from viewers about this in just the past week. I went to do what I thought was going to be a routine interview. Instead, we capture what police and property owners are dealing with on a daily basis. I have video of you. Oh, my God. Who oh, are these people? The situation. Yeah, but they're in my oh. house, man. Relax. No, 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 no. This to understand okay. how this day ended. We need the police right away. With multiple 911 calls and arrests. We have to start at the beginning. Adele, the hardest question is, how do you say your name? We met Adele and Deloro outside the home her parents left her in Flushing, Queens. She's in the process of selling it. No, he loved it. But she's been locked out. She claims squatters moved in on February 6th and refused to leave. What's it like being here knowing you can't go inside of your own home? It's enraging. It really is. In New York, squatters have rights after 30 days. By the time that someone does their investigation and they do their work and their job, will be well over the 30 days, and this man will have stolen my home. And now she's back. Just after wrapping up our interview, a woman showed no, I'm not going to play are you the doing in the video, guys, but uh, just to give you an idea, this woman ended the day being arrested. 
She was arrested because um, a man later claimed that he had a lease. And the police said, we will not look into this. This needs to go to court. Now, this is happening all the while while this is viral on social media. Please watch this. Mi gente, he pensado invadir una casa en Junei State. Ya que me enteré que existe una ley que dice que si una casa no está habitada, podemos expropiarla. Capichi, muchachos, aquí en Junei State también se aplica la de invasión de yeah, terreno. Y incredible. creo que ese será mi that, próximo uh, negocio. Invadir casas coming. abandonadas. Houses, ya que me he buscado houses. unos códigos Hire con mis amigos africanos. Y me dijeron que ya llevan como you know, siete casas expropiadas. Y como dice el dicho, they, papi, hay que buscar la vuelta. Days. Y you know, la vuelta, vuelta ahorita mismo sure es invadir in the house casas. Ya que no encontramos en yes, situación de calle. Y es la again, única manera que tenemos para no yeah. vivir en but la calle y no ser smart una carga pública. La ley dice que las casas days. abandonadas, so deterioradas y que esté en mal estado, so podemos llegar y repararlas viviendo en ellas y si podemos reparlas. Reparlas. It will happen, but what's happened is these guys get in and they destroy the homes. They've even there's things of killing uh the actual owners and everything and uh and then tearing the place up costing tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to the houses and the police protect them you know immigrants these uh migrants have become uh uh lawbreakers and the law is supporting them we got it yet there jay yeah, we're, we're, we're done with it. Um, and I I actually wanted to share oh, We this. never saw it. Oh, you never saw it? The video? No, that's why I was talking, trying to... Oh, I, I played yeah. it. Yeah. wonder why you guys didn't see it. Oh, I... Let me... Well, the screen scare share didn't come up. Usually you have it that and then oh, it plays. So sorry about that. I will play that again. I was feeling air. How about this? Mi gente, he pensado invadir una casa en Junei State. Ya que me enteré que existe una ley que dice que si una casa no está habitada, podemos expropiarla. Capichi, muchachos, aquí en Junei State también se aplica la de invasión de terreno. Y creo que ese será mi próximo negocio. Invadir casas abandonadas, ya que me he buscado unos códigos con mis amigos africanos y me dijeron que ya llevan como siete casas expropiadas. Y como dice el dicho, papi, hay que buscar la vuelta. Y la vuelta ahorita mismo es invadir casas, ya que nos encontramos en situación de calle. Y es la única manera que tenemos para no vivir en la calle y no ser una carga pública. Capichi, la ley dice que las casas abandonadas, deterioradas y que esté en mal estado, podemos llegar y repararlas, vivir en ella y si podemos venderla, hasta pedir créditos con ella. ¿Qué dicen ustedes? All right, so come to the United States to be. Yeah. <laughs> he called it an invasion. He, 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 he sure he's did. He's calling it, it worked in the invasion. He sure did. Um, I, I had a passage I wanted to run by you guys, and I think it, it equally can be interpreted as both talking about maybe the October 7th, but also let's talk about it in the, in the scope of people coming from another place and taking the fruits of the land. I'm going to read Judges 6, 3 through 6. For whenever, he, for whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the peoples of the east and march against them. They would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth 
as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance in Israel, nor sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in tents, and they would come like locusts in numbers, and both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to ruin it. Is that, so, is that a fair... Is that a fair interpretation of that scripture to modern events where you have people that coming across the border to yes. take what other people built? Yep. Yep. That absolutely is. You know, I always, I remember years ago, I said the United States and other Western countries need to have the kind of border to keep people from entering illegally the way that the Russians had, or the communists had, to keep people inside the Iron Curtain. We need, you know, a Berlin Wall, not to keep people in, but to keep people out who don't enter legally. A guy like that should have been barbecued coming across electrified barbed wire or shot by trying to get into the country illegally. I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of actually having sentry posts and shooting illegal aliens climbing the fence illegally. I put a warning sign, you, you, you'll be shot dead on sight, don't cross this, it's at your own peril. I'd warn them, I'd not seek to murder them, but you cross this illegally, you get shot, no questions asked. I believe that's the kind of border the United States should have. You apply for a green card, you apply for a visa, but if you climb over that fence illegally, you're going to be used for target practice, and we don't care. Yeah. However... Mayorkas and Biden should be stood against the wall after they've been tried for treason, and they should be shot. <laughs> they are responsible for this. Now, as far as that woman, I'm sorry for what happened to her and her home in Queens. But if she's a Democrat, if she voted for Obama, if she voted for Biden, if she voted for Adams, if that's who she voted for, she has nothing to complain about. She's only reaping the fruit of her own stupidity. She's only getting what she voted for. They have every right to steal her house because she gave it to them. If she voted for the squad, if she voted liberal, she voted Democrat, she gave them the right to steal their house. She deserves nothing better. But if she didn't, it's an outrage and a disgrace that she was arrested. Yep. Absolutely agreed. David, you're a homeowner. Um, if you came home from, you know, you, you also travel quite a bit. If you came home from yeah. your, your travels abroad and found people squatting in your home, what would you do? Well, being a good red-blooded American, believing in the Second Amendments and everything, and having a great share that believes that uh, a man's home is his castle, uh, I hopefully... I I would hate to kill anybody, but I would make sure that I was armed and that they were removed. Hopefully get out quickly, you know, but where I live, many people would just shoot them, mm. you know, just shoot them dead. Then the chef yeah. would say, yeah. thank I, I wouldn't want to see that illegal alien who was yelling, we yeah. have a right to take your home, we're invaders. I would not like to see him deported. I'd like to just see him shot. But my, I mean, fortunately, if you're going to deport him, deport him in the body bag. Yeah. Well, my fortunately, my house is Hotel Moriel, and there's always somebody there and uh, people coming and going. So I'm very happy about that. Um, but, you know, Trump, if you remember, Trump did something very good. He just shut down the border and caused great economic hardship to Mexico. And uh, things uh, all of a sudden got negotiated and uh, Mexico closed their own border to migrants. You know, it just shows you that Trump, uh, Biden doesn't care. This is his plan to destroy America by allowing an invasion. I'm thankful that uh, Governor Abbott and, and Attorney General Paxson got the law through the Supreme Court to be able to stop them, at least in Texas. Although they were overwhelmed, I believe, in El Paso. I think we have a video of that. Yes, we'll, we'll get to that in, in due course. But I you know, I wanted to ask Davey, Davey, as, as an Australian, when you see 
uh, homeowners being arrested by the police on behalf of squatters. And when you see illegal aliens from Venezuela calling for their compatriots to come and take houses from Americans by squatting in them, what, what's your reaction to that? Is that? Do you have a similar problem in Australia like that? Well, <clears throat> yes. Look, they get, it can happen here too. And then look, I do know of an incident that's even happened in the country town where I live, where uh, basically a woman <laughs> had trouble getting rid of the squatters who were squatting in her backyard, basically in a, a shed. So we look, it is a problem here in Australia too. Uh, I just see it myself as utter lawlessness, the lawless, the spirit of lawlessness that's coming about in the times that we live in. You know, we're going back to an age of chaos, you know, uh, where there's no order, no law and order anymore. We're going back to lawlessness and chaos. Yeah. Hey, Jake. Um, yes, sir. It, it is interesting that banks have been repossessing large, large numbers of houses. In fact, banks are becoming the largest uh, homeowners in America and they want to rent them, but all these houses don't have people in them. So I could well see that these banks will lose all this money as squatters start taking homes that are in repossession but not yet having been fixed up so they, and put back on the market. So for me, that would be kind of justification for the banks for, and, and, you know, many, many people, you could, there's videos out there. Where people can't afford their houses anymore that Obama's inflation. I mean, uh, Joe Obama's inflation is just making it so hard to make a living and to have home ownership and people are losing their homes or having to get in it. There's a big video by a bunch of Hollywood uh, workers, now ex-workers, they can't get no work. And they're complaining that they're gonna lose their houses and things like this. So it's pretty interesting. These guys used to make really good money, but now they can't even afford a house payment. Uh, that's interesting, David. I, I think the, I think if a, a bank owns a home that there's maybe a different set of laws in the United States mm -hmm. where the the police will come and and beat the uh, squatter and then push them out into the street. While as if it's privately owned, I think they won't do anything. In fact, they'll arrest the uh, the homeowner. But a bank, I think the banks have special protection. Probably, I'm. Th this well, is just me guessing. Yeah, I, look, I I hope that's true, but you know. Let's see what happens because they're going to not know. They'll say, well, I'm fixing it up. And the uh, banks will say, you got to get out. But if that's true, but, uh, you know, I remember uh, there's a, a book by Anne Ryan, We the Living, uh, her first book. And she talked about how commies took over homes and how they move citizens out. It's oh. playing out just like that. Prognostication. In how her home was yeah. You know, that's what happened in Cuba. And when the communists go in Cuba, you're going to have all these Cuban-American families going back there wanting to reclaim the property that was taken from them by Castro. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, but they got millions of people, you know, they got millions of uh, immigrants, 17 million immigrants. Those houses, I... I just I could well see the government just doesn't protect the banks. You know, they want to bankrupt us anyway. Mm. So this is the truth. Now, this also goes to something uh, you mentioned earlier. Uh, we have yet another video that we want to go to real quick. This one is uh, to your point about people coming across the border. Let me pull this. <laughs> Just let me rewind that. Get this prepared. Isn't this about chocolate chip ice cream? Oh, I, I believe so. <laughs> let, let, let me go ahead and so. I'm sorry that that that's the that's the wrong clip. How did that get in there? 
Um, here we go. This is the New York Post. So we have uh, a border breach um, down at the U.S. southern border. The Texas National Guard was rushed by hundreds of illegals angry at being uh, deported. Uh, when asked for a comment, Biden said, chocolate chip, Rocky Road, or Helado, they're all very good yeah. to me. So this I would is have liked this to see is Texas National Guard open fire with automatic weapons and just mow them down. Yeah. That's what I would like to see happen. But of course the Biden administration is legally challenging the right of Texas to protect the border. The border. Yeah. Saying it's the responsibility of the federal government, we don't want to do it. So you can't do it. We don't care about the crime, we don't care about the fentanyl, we don't care about the narco terror, the human trafficking. We're going to let it happen, and you do not have the right to do it. It's the responsibility of the federal government, and and we're not gonna. This is what you're dealing with. This yeah. is what you are dealing with. But we know, Jacob, because the FBI just told us that crime is going down in America. I know they would never lie about FISA. I know there are men of integrity that would believe not believe a dossier but why is the fbi saying crimes going down the fbi is going back to the time of jed Hoover. the fbi has never had any integrity and has never told the truth about anything they've oh. always been the enemy of the country in my opinion they they, they absolute and reporters are still getting a second paycheck from the cia are promoting that Crime report, crime is going down. They're bolstering Biden's achievements, and that's what they're saying is one, that crime is going down. And uh, and it's not true, but the FBI is pushing it and the reporters are pushing it. Sad. Yeah. Uh, my question that I'd like to ask uh, everybody here, it seems that no matter where you go in the world, um, Tex uh, whether it be Texas, the United States, whether it be Canada, it seems that borders have no meaning for the people that are in charge, whether they be left or right. Um, why are the leaders of the world so hell-bent on importing people who by definition are criminals by breaking laws of immigration? Of course, globalism. Hmm. If you want globalism, you don't want borders, obviously. Yeah. Jacob, from a biblical standpoint, is this lining up the north against the south? Is this going to oh, be? Yes, there will. Look, for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. There will be a reaction against illegal aliens in the United States, and that they will try to racialize it, but it will not be racial. You will see Hispanic Americans bearing arms against illegal immigrants. Um, Europe, the same. We're already seeing the rudiments of a reaction against Islamic immigration into Europe. For every action, there will be an equal and opposite reaction. You look what happened. Britain and France and, and, and Spain, well, they and Portugal, but particularly Britain and France, they, they colonized the world. Well, look what's happening now to Britain. They're being recolonized. By them. They themselves are being colonized. For every action, there will be an equal and opposite reaction, and there will be a reaction to this immigration. My only plea is that somehow people like Biden and Obama and Mayorkas and Garland will be brought to justice for their betrayal. Yeah. yeah. I right. think we're right. I think you were right with what you were saying too with the globalism too. It's kind of like they're trying to create this artificial one world unity that's never going to come about. Instead, we're going to have an what? increase in the ethnic tensions that you talk about. 
was. Most certainly. Well, I want to get on to our next topic. Our next topic is talking about some really bad apostasy that's going on today in the church. I'm going to begin by showing you this video of this uh, incredible sermon that was preached in uh, some crazy church in the Northwest. Yes, Seattle area. What if God worships me? Can you say that with me? What if God worships me? A God who worships me is quite the statement. I know, but follow me. Now I get it, we've started to worship a very big heteronormative white Jesus that we constantly thank for standing between us and a mean God. But really, really, who, what, when, and why? Worship has become so God-centered that it risks the subjective colliding of our own things, our biases, etc. What if worship is us on the mountain of transfiguration? This space where God spoke that God was well pleased. This place where God spoke about God's son in such a way that the light shone on him and God looked and said, wow. What if worship is Genesis 3 and 8 that says, when God says, where are you? And who told you that you were naked? Who told you that there was a flaw in your beauty? The God who meets us and keeps confirming that who we are is good enough. What if that's worship? We declare that you are a God that worships us. That's how much you love us. That's how much you desire us. That's how much you are for us. Or when we step into your presence, we come with our full selves. Fully naked and unclothed. And there is no shame. Because what you have created since the very beginning you declare good and it is still good okay let's break that craziness down uh jacob god worships us look at, at the way he says it as if he's making a plausible argument um can you say it with me and he manipulates the people and in their stupidity they say it and then he says, we've made worship God-centric, so God-centric that it's a risk to us and our biases. And then the people singing the music and like they're worshiping, but only it's about God worshiping them. This is the deification of man gone mad. God worships us. What could be more antithetical? to the Judeo-Christian scriptures. What could be more insulting to the God of the scriptures? This is the kind of wickedness we see. People like this are going to hell. They're going to hell. How will they not go to hell? They demand God Almighty worships them? He worships us because he loves us? They put the boots on the wrong feet. Now notice this church, it's into the race part, the race agenda. It's a racist church. Heterophobic, heteronormative, white male God. It's into the LGBTQ agenda. What goes next? God worships us. And they mimic Christianity. Can you say it with me? Yeah, go say it with them, and you'll be saying it forever in the pit of hell. Mm. David, let me ask you a question. Are are we to the point where sound doctrine 
is not being endured by any of the American, well, the American mainstream church. Let, let's go there. I'm not going to say the entire church, but this is a this is definitely a church that I'm sure is very popular in in their area. In Wa in Washington State, yeah, that's that would probably be the norm, but nationwide and worldwide, we're seeing that there is no theology. People, there's no making of disciples and training them, and so theology is one inch deep, and so people don't have doctrine. Trying to get somebody to, just to explain, tell me what you believe, it's it's you. They can't. Many, many people, they 20 years, I'm a Christian. Well, what do you believe that makes you a Christian? Uh, 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 uh. And, you know, and so it's no wonder the Christian church is in the state that it is in is because people don't know what they believe. They don't know why they believe it. And so therefore they can't, if you don't know why you believe, how do you explain somebody and help them come to Jesus? This Then this is now affected that the church is not growing and general growth is just one guy leaving one church for another church because they got that new popular teacher you know that's got the new thing you know but uh doctrine has gone out the window and i mean paul had something similar five years in corinth and he's still feeding them milk mm -hmm. two thousand years later we still have the same problem People, the people are living on milk and and perishing because they don't know what they believe. Davey, and I have their a lives. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, David. Um, Davey, I have a question for yeah. you. Uh, Jeremiah seventeen five through eight. Thus says the Lord: Cursed is the man who trusts in man, and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he sh shall be like a shrub in a desert. And shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt lands, which is not inhabited. Do you think that that speaker has ever read that verse in their life? No, <laughs> no, definitely not. To me, you, know, you know, when I watch that, the first thing I think of is what it says about in Second Timothy, um, but on steroids, you know men will become lovers of themselves that's it on steroids you know having that form of godliness but denying the power thereof um and what he said too you know when um he referred to that verse where you know when jesus was baptized and the voice came from heaven saying you know uh this is you my are my son. beloved yeah. In, yeah in whom i'm who are in whom I am well pleased. Well, Jesus, Jesus um, came. He emptied himself. He came to serve. He not to be served. He um, he he was faithful unto death. He, he always had the attitude, not my will, but your will be done. He only did what you know the Father would have him do. He never acted independent from his Father. It was all. This guy is seeking, yeah, glory for himself. It's self deification. It's, it's absolutely ab abhorrent, it, and it, it's so contrary. Look, we're new creations in Christ. The old creation is dead. We, it's no longer I that lives. It's Christ who lives in us. There's none of that. It's just total devoid of any substance or any any redemptive qualities. It's kind of like I was watching the comments come up on the Rumble chat, and everyone's kind of. <laughs> doing these uh, little gag emojis and stuff like that. And I can't blame them. It's just absolutely abhor abhorrent and uh, total foreign to the word of God. I, I'm, I swear he must know none of it. But you know what he said? Let's go back to Genesis. Now, what happened in Genesis? Satan said, you will be like God. God knows you will be like him. We want to be worshipped. And he says, go back to that very passage where yeah. Satan spoke that to Adam and Eve. You shall be like God. Yeah. You yeah. when you know good and evil and become a law to yourself, you shall be like he goes right back. And, and that, that Satan wanted for man to begin with. Yeah, and that's what Satan wanted too. Satan was the one who wanted yes. worship. He wanted the 
to be worshipped, to be like God. Of course. You know, know, God, Jacob, Jesus came into the garden to rescue them from their sin. And this guy is saying, no, this is, this is not about sin. He turns something that's clearly about sin and where Jesus comes to get them and help them out of their sin. And he turns it into things where he's only going there t- so that he could worship them and pronounce. That is he pronounces, correct. He pronounces evil good. It is almost impossible for a person like that not to go to hell. Almost impossible. Yeah. Turning to our next story, which is. With him. Oh. He's taking me uh, blind or leading the blind in the ditch. And they're not just a two, but they're taking people by the truckloads. Hell is engulfed, widening its mouth daily, engulfing many. Absolutely. Uh, I want to keep going with this topic because it, we have a few stories along this line about Christianity in the West. The Gospel Coalition released a parallel to the Gospel and I'm going to read you the lyrics, and then you're going to be, you might be surprised, maybe you're not surprised, but this is what they call the gospel at the Gospel Coalition. I lived, and I learned, had you got burned, held out and held on, God knows too long, and wasted lost tears, sworn that I'd get out of here, but no amount of freedom gets you clean, you're not my homeland anymore. Now I'm in exile. You showed me something that I couldn't see. You opened my eyes and made me believe. Help me hold on to you. I never saw you coming, and I'll never be the same. This state of grace. Hell was a hell was the journey, but it brought me heaven, the green light of forgiveness. You haven't met the new me yet. I just want to know you better, know you better, know you better now. All I know is you held the door. You'll be mine and I'll be yours. This is the Gospel Coalition's release statement. They're poets, but they stole every single line from a Taylor Swift song. Oh, oh. I guess the Gospel Coalition doesn't feel relevant to today's society, so they decided to nope, use it, the uh, popularity of Taylor Swift. Um, yeah. Is this what we should yeah. be building the message on, You know, using Taylor Swift as a spokesperson for the Gospel? Jacob, you want that? Well, what more can be said? Yeah. The Gospel Coalition, what surprised me about it, some fairly orthodox people had been associated with it at one time, and some still are. Now, I've never thought it was any good, but there were some people who would identify it as conservative evangelical who who, who were engaged with it. Have they lost the, they've lost the plot, haven't they, Jacob? They've lost more than the plot. They've gone right back to the, the, to the first sin of man when Satan put it into Adam's head. You can be God. You can be like God. Yeah. When you reach that point, what else needs to be said? Nothing. Yeah. You're right back to Genesis 3. Yeah. Taylor Swift is famous for her songs about breakup of bad yeah. relationships and everything. And so now she's being used as a commentary on the good news of Jesus Christ that that you can have a wonderful relationship when she pretty much has a track record of uh, relationships relationships. that go into the uh, garbage dump. Yeah, And and, and this is the crazy thing too. It says a lot about the Gospel Coalition where they are, that they would go to a modern-day pop singer who you know, professors to have satanic ties, basically. They would go to that to get theology and doctrine instead of going to the pure, unadulterated yes. word of God. You've got the pure 
and an adulterated word of God, why would you need to return turn to someone who basically says she yes. worships Satan? Yes. Hmm. You you see on her tour, you see that she has um, all sorts of satanic symbols. She has women uh, dancers dressed up in black witch-like costumes and circles and. Uh, there's a lot of, of movements while she denies it. Uh, it's kind of undeniable. And even she even speaks out, Taylor speaks out to the good witches. Mm. You know, Anton LaVey, who she, she actually looks, Taylor Swift actually looks like Anton LaVey's daughter with a hairstyle and everything. But that's another thing. But the, Anton LaVey said of witchcraft and magic he said there's no such thing as white magic there's only dark magic and when you turn the handle on that door and enter in you don't know what you're going to get if you ever want to read something frightening read the account of his death and what happened to him in the last few days of his life absolutely yeah. All right. So we've talked about the Gospel Coalition. We talked about liberal Christianity. Now let's go to a revered, revered teacher. Um, people still talk about how great he is. Uh, it's unbelievable to me. But uh, let's talk about John Piper and his uh, statement that is kind of crazy. What are we after in our people's lives? And everybody said, obedience. So did I, amen. But you had already quoted, if you love me, you will obey me. So I'm thinking, I'm after love, folks. And you are too. And because that love, that love is not equal to obedience, and that love is not equal to agape. That love is erotic to the core. That's, that's an overstatement. Eros means I find pleasure in you, Jesus. I find pleasure in you, Jesus. You are my preciousness. And there comes obedience. All right. Let's, uh, let's try to dissect that a bit. Jacob, what, can, what do you have to say about John Piper? And uh, we're supposed to have Impressive. arrows. Look, I've never liked, trusted, or respected John Piper at all. Never. I thought people who did were very gullible. John Piper was replacement theology. I always said, if somebody is wrong about Israel, they're wrong in their other doctrine. Israel is a litmus test. Being right about Israel and understanding God's prophetic purposes for Israel doesn't guarantee somebody is right in their other doctrine. But being wrong about Israel guarantees they're going to be wrong in their other doctrine. Piper has always failed that litmus test. Secondly, he's reformed. He's a Calvinist. That's the second problem. Uh, his third problem. I saw him leading the Lectio Divina with the mystic Beth Moore. Now, how crazy can you get? What kind of a conservative evangelical Bible expositor would align themselves with Beth Moore, a mystic, and with eyes closed, enter into the mystical realm and lead the Lectio Divina? And he led the Lectio Divina with Beth Moore. Thousands of people. He was on the stage with her leading it. He is somebody who is perverted spiritually, and perverted doctrinally. And now we see he has a perverted mind. I would first of all challenge his definition of eros, of erotic love. We do see expressions of erotic love that are manifested or conveyed in an anthropomorphic way in the Song of Solomon. But that romance between Solomon and Shulamit 
is representative of God's love for Israel and Christ's love for the church and vice versa. It is always corporate. It is always corporate. To think about Jesus erotically in a personal relationship, this is a perversion. It goes back to the Greek, pagan Greek, Hieros, Gamos, and, 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 and the temple prostitution of the ancient world, where you would have an erotic fixation with a god or a goddess. It was something that was adopted by Roman Catholic nuns in the Middle Ages who followed the Catholic Gnostics, like Teresa of Avila, where Jesus would be seen as a personal lover or something like this. Erotic love is an anthropomorphic expression of intimacy with Christ between Christ and the church or God and Israel. It is always corporate. As soon as you begin talking about erotic love as personal, you're entering into the realm of the perverted. You're entering into the realm of the perverted. It does not surprise me because his doctrine was perverted. His replacement theology was perverted. His Reformed theology was wrong. But what he did with Beth Moore, the mysticism, was absolutely sickening. I've never liked him. I've never trusted him. I've never respected him. I never wanted anything to do with him. And I always made people aware that he was a false teacher. Now you see what he really is. David, do you have anything to add or did to that? Well, well, I do remember when John uh, Piper went in with another teacher that I have no respect for, and that is uh, uh, our purpose-driven friend. Yes. And he went in with him, and he went down a trail, and it seems like he keeps going from bad to worse. So anybody likes John Piper, they should uh, really start thinking about, are they in the truth? You know, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Piper yeah. brushes that off. He literally brushed that off and began talking about erotic attraction. I, I never liked John Piper for his Christian hedonism, which he was promoting, gosh, years ago, at least 20 years ago. Um, where he basically turns God into a, a commodity for our enjoyment, for our pleasure. Um, and this seems to be the next step. It's like yeah. Christian hedon in, hedonism on steroids. But, um, yeah, it's utterly perverse. Jacob, is this, uh, this movement to this pleasure eroticism, it almost lines up with that other preacher from Washington and the pleasure that he's experiencing is are, are, Mark is Mark Driscoll? Huh? Mark Driscoll? No, no, the one we just watched, the black. Oh movie. yeah, 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 yeah. And at the same time, yeah. like they're all going to pleasure and to eros. Yes, yes, and, yes. I mean, of course. Well, you see, that's what the early Christians were up against with the Athena worship and the Hieros Gamos and the temple prostitution. This is a, this constitutes much of the background of, of First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. Well, Paul and Corinth in the Book of Acts, it had this kind of thinking in its zeitgeist, the spirit of that age, and it's the spirit of our age. We're moving into a spirit of carnality within the church. It's yes, Corinthians all over again sure. we've not well, been we, we, we saw the carnality in the toronto and pensacola yep. counterfeits that was the beginning of it i suppose among evangelicals at least or professing evangelicals i mean the fact that you have the gospel coalition quoting what was a love song about a breakup as the gospel yeah. carn carnality yes. seems to be the check mark for 
all of this Christianity that seems to be the popular it mainstream. It does. Well, I think that's going to conclude our show as far as front stage. We have a few topics uh, for backstage, but more importantly, we have your questions. So please stick around. We're going to go ahead and, and shut down YouTube. We're going to shut down Facebook and Meta and Instagram because they're not going to like what we're going to talk about, especially the questions you bring up. Uh, so stay with us. Come to Rumble. Come to X. Uh, go to Moriel TV and uh, watch backstage with us. We're looking forward to having you there. Till then, to YouTube, to everybody else, uh, thank you for watching.